morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys this morning. And no, it's not a joke. They're having me preach on maturity. And uh, I, I, sh- I shared that with my daughter last night, and she goes, do they know we have one adult in this house and it's not you? And uh, so anyway, um, John Hershberger, uh, eat your heart out. They didn't ask you. So uh, no, if you have your Bibles, can you uh, turn with me to Colossians uh, chapter 2? Um, I haven't listened to all of what's been shared online, but um, I've kind of got the cliff notes from Chris Berkey, and he kind of shared a little bit, and it sounds like there's been a lot of in him, about being in Christ talk, about in him, in him, in him, in him. And I want to kind of dovetail off of that, or just try to be real practical about that this morning, of how that can affect our daily lives, I hope. Um, And obviously, I'm not coming at this from one who is mature, um, as my daughter will let you know, uh, but one who has a lot of maturing to do. Um, I do think about you guys often at Cornerstone here, miss you guys. We actually have a couple of Jim and Larmay's grandsons that are part of our community uh, on a regular basis and uh, in West Lafayette. So that's always fun and always thinking about um, you guys as well as we have them in our midst. So... Colossians chapter 2, all right? Um, And then, actually, if you have your Bibles as well, go ahead and start to flip over to Philemon as well. Philemon is kind of a practical outworking or a little case study, and we're going to try to look at that in the same light as well today. Um, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this. My kiddos are now uh, in eighth grade, going to be in high school next year, and um, it has me in a panic as I realized, well, my son, I was telling Jay, my son came down the other day and said, Dad, I'm almost 15, so that pretty much means I'll be driving anytime soon. And so I think I need to be make more of the decisions that are affecting me personally on a regular basis. So just so you know that. And uh, so that was my son, and that uh, made me panic and think I have four years, four and a half years um, in this type of light before he graduates high school to uh, put a lot of things that probably would be considered maturing you know, into our kid's life. And, um, you know, God places us in families, and I'm not, con- I'm not convinced that it's just that the kids have the maturing to do in a family, but I've grown a lot with kids, and I've seen a lot of things about myself um, as I've become a parent. And he puts us in families for maturing. And um, this morning I want to look at what we're looking at, this maturing thing of realizing the family that God's placed us in. Do you know that he's placed us all in a family for the sake of becoming more and more like him? That this isn't a thing that we just do on our own. It's not one of these things that we need to go away and study and just become on our own, but he actually has given us a gift of a family to help us become more and more like him. Look around. He's given us a family as a gift to help us become more and more like him. And so if I mess everything up today, uh, remember that part, okay? Um, That we're not in this on our own. And actually, I don't think this can happen outside of family. Um, I believe that God actually, this is the way he's planned and purpose for it to work. It's the way he started many, many years ago. And uh, even when he pulled the disciples to himself, he called them to himself. He walked with them in a deep way and then release them, commission them to go and do likewise. And uh, we're part of a family where we get to help one another become more and more like him. Church is not just a service. It is a family that gets to help one another mature and become more and more like him, all right? So Colossians chapter 2, and then we're going to go to Philemon, all right? Colossians 2, let's read. We're going to read a little bit today, all right? Uh, And I'm not going to apologize because it's the Word of God and it's better than my words, all right? So Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, I want you to know, Paul says, how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. 
For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness, how? In Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, You were also circumcised in the putting off of sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. You guys just went through Colossians not too long ago, right? Right? Did you guys do the series on Colossians? Am I thinking right? Okay. And nobody's shaking their head. Do you guys remember? Were you here? It was really impactful, right? Um, let me just give you, I'm going to do the two minute over, the 30 second overview since you just did this, all right? But Paul has a concern as he's writing to the church at Colossae, right? About some of the teaching that they've had. Um, and he's trying to correct some false teaching or some teaching that has had some problems with it. And he says, um, he talks about hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition, right? Which is also from elemental, element, elemental, how do you say that? Elemental, elemental, I was way off. Elemental spiritual forces of this world and false teaching, which doesn't depend on Christ, all right? And as he does this, as he opens up, and it's all over, it's about the supremacy and the centrality of Christ over and over and over. If you had a dollar for every time he says, in Christ, or puts Jesus front and center in this book, we'd be wealthy, right? Um, And so over and over and over, he's trying to say, hey, this false teaching, this problem that you had, it's it's put Christ at the center, put him, and make him central and supreme over everything, all right? So that's the book of, of Colossians over and over as Paul's trying to address this. Now, another book, the little Philemon, go ahead and flip there. Um, was written probably at the same time, probably sent with the exact same letter of Colossians um, to the church, and probably read, it appears, in front of the church at the exact same time. And it's almost like it's this little case study, all right? So he says, I'm going to address some of the false teaching, some of the problem that's been going on in your midst. And as he does that, he sends this little letter along as well that's a very personal letter, which is read in front of the entire church, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Um, And basically says this problem that's between the two of you is actually not just a personal problem. It's actually a church issue. And let's just address it in front of everyone. And it has everything to do with what he just said and the rest about having Christ front and center and being found in him. And you're going to see it just in regards to this one little relationship, how they have to take what he's just said about being in Christ and put it and apply it to this relationship between the slave and slave owner, where there's a issue of relationship. And it's kind of what we get to do every single day, about being in Christ, about making him supreme, about putting him front and center, making him central, and let's apply it now to a relationship. Let's apply it to finances. Let's apply it to our family, right? And so we're going to look at this in Philemon. I think it's really fun. Uh, It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. Uh, not because it's a really, you know, like everybody's favorite verse as a kid is Jesus wept because he can remember that one, right? It's not because it's one of the shortest, uh, but I think it's really powerful in the way that he um, really speaks into this relationship, all right? And probably let us, as we talk about being placed in a family, let it hit us again that this was read probably in front of the whole community. That Paul says, hey, let's address this thing in your this actually affects all of you. And uh, read this in front of their whole church community. All right. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, and to Aphia, our sister, 
and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my sons Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him back, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is, a very, dear, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to John Hirschberger, um, to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I might have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Uh, uh, Pephras, Pephras, yes, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus sends you greetings, as do Mark and Aristarchus and this other guy, Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. Okay. That was a lot, right? We just read a lot, but let's, let's have some fun and kind of just talking about how Paul takes this thing about being in Christ and Christ being central and addressing some of the false teachings that things that aren't dependent on Christ and tries to apply it to the situation in the midst of this community, all right? Um, but can you do me a favor? Can you say fellowship with me? Okay, like, like you mean it, like you're charismatic, like it's really exciting, all right? All right, fellowship, all right? He's going to bring home this idea, all right? And um, just to go with the background again, this slave Onesimus, who's part of the church community at uh, Colossae, uh, as well as his slave owner Philemon, are there, all right? Um, So Onesimus runs off. He bumps into Paul somewhere. We don't know the whole story. He might have helped himself to a little bit for the travel journey. We don't know. We don't know the situation totally, but we do know that in the Roman Empire, a runaway slave is punishable by capital punishment. Uh, we know that the, basically the Roman Empire was built upon the back of slaves. A city like Colossae might have had a third of its population as slaves, basically. And it looked like everything from really rough conditions in the salt mine to running people's homes for them um, and everything in between. And so It was just the the air, the fabric of the society. It was like the air you breathe. It was just there. It was everywhere. And Paul's trying to navigate this situation and also applying the principle that in Christ, things are a bit different. In Christ, because of Christ being central and Christ being supreme overall, that it's going to be handled differently in the midst of the community of faith. It's going to look different, okay? So for Paul, although the Roman Empire says... This is how you handle a runaway slave. For Paul, that's not an option. For Paul, because of he's them being in Christ, there's a much different way of handling one another. Restoration and justice looks much different because they are a community that is founded 
in Christ, all right? Um, can you do me a favor real quick? Can you say fellowship with me? Fellowship. fellowship. Okay, we're going to get to that point here in a second, all right? Um, so this is what is happening in this church, and this letter is read in front of everyone, all right? Um, the, if you got your Bibles in front of you, look at verse uh, 6. We're going to look at verse 6 and verse 17, all right? So Paul is addressing this issue about in Christ who they are with one another, all right? Um, do you know that when we're in Christ, we're grafted into a family with brothers and sisters? Do you know that we're adopted into his family? When he is our father, we have brothers and sisters that are part of this great family of ours. The central theme of the entire book of Philemon is this thing of fellowship. Uh, the word in the Greek is koinonia, all right? If, you guys, if you've been around church long enough, you've heard the term koinonia over and over again. It's uh, mentioned in two different forms in verse 17, is one, so if you consider me a partner, or if you consider yourself in fellowship with me, Paul says, welcome him as you would welcome me, all right? So if you consider yourself in fellowship, uh, welcome him as you would welcome me. In verse 6, it's a, another form of it as well. I pray that you may be active in the sharing of your faith, or in the fellowship of your faith, or in the mutual participation of your faith. Um, it depends on what translation you have there, but it's that same word, koinonia, all right, that I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you may have full understanding of every good thing that you have in Christ, all right? So Paul has a revelation. We don't even know what he totally thinks about slavery at this point in time. Uh, we really don't know how much of a revelation he has. We know that if we were encouraging Paul probably today, just go ahead and declare the truth boldly, Mr. Paul. Don't compromise say that it's a sin, is probably how we would say, right? Um, but Paul goes further than just saying something is wrong in slavery. And I want us to just catch that for a second here. Because this whole idea of being in Christ means that it's not just not about this, where we can stop. You're missing the mark, Philemon. Let me just give you a big, long proof of why this is wrong and bad, and this isn't the way we handle one another, but Paul is going to who they are, how? In Christ. In Christ, he tells Philemon, you actually have a brother. He's not a slave anymore. It's to your advantage that I'm actually sending him back, because in Christ, this relationship supersedes the relationship that you had before, because Christ is supreme. Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is. Roman law is not Lord, Jesus' law and instruction is. Roman law says you can put him to death. In Christ, that's not even on his mind. Are you with me at all? In Christ, he's your brother. And he saying, come on. On, do you see who he is to you? It doesn't depend on human tradition. This depends on Christ. Do you know every day, you know, the way I run my household is, is because the household I grew up in. The way my wife does some things that are wrong is because the household she grew up in. And I've been working on her, but she hasn't quite got there yet in a couple of areas right? It's tradition. It's the way I've done things. It's the way we, it's the flow of things around us. But Paul says, listen, in Christ, it supersedes all of those things, those human traditions. This is how you would relate differently in this situation because of being in Christ. Can you say fellowship with me for a second? Fellowship. fellowship. Paul Presses that actually what they have in Christ is a fellowship that's going to change everything. What they have in Christ will cause the Roman Empire to be different. What they have in Christ will cause relationships to be different. What they have in Christ will cause everybody to see restoration different. What they have in Christ will cause everybody to see justice as different. 
what they have in Christ is going to cause everything to change because his kingdom is coming in through his people who say Jesus is Lord and supreme and everything. Are you with me at all on this? Let me just read what a couple commentators say. This goes way beyond fellowship. It goes way beyond slavery. But this is just a wonderful little example, I think, of flushing out Paul's heart. I want you to have knowledge, all the wisdom that's found in Christ. This is what it looks like. This is one little bit of that that he's saying affect the relationship between the two of you. All right? Um, One commentator says this. In the epistle of Philemon, Paul urges Philemon to accept Onesimus in a way that radically alters the slave-master relationship. It is their kinship as brothers in Messiah and co-workers for the kingdom that transcends societal norms and transforms their attitudes, actions, and responses towards each other with a decidedly Christian ethic. You may have wronged me. You may have taken my, some of my stuff as you ran off. But because I'm in Christ, I see you differently. I saw you with no use before. Now I accept you as I accept Paul himself who saved me. Because you're a dear brother. F.F. Bruce says this, Uh, Philemon brings us into an atmosphere in which the institution of slavery could only but wilt and die. I love that. Some of the things that are in society can only wilt and die because they are in Christ. And they handle their relationships differently because of Christ. Paul and Onesimus and others says, and Philemon are bound together in faith and forced by circumstances to think through the radical implications of their koinonia. Radical implications of their fellowship. You guys see fellowship having radical implications? I kind of think, when I think of fellowship, I kind of think of like Sunday afternoon Bears game, like overeating like kind of talking to the people next to you, but not too much because it might interrupt the game a little bit. You know what I mean? Like kind of enjoy your company as long as you're not talking too loud and distracting too much and rooting against my team. Like, you know, that, that kind of is fellowship for me. But Paul says actually fellowship is defined in Christ in a different way. Hello? Are you with me the way he's proclaiming truth into this situation? You're in Christ, people. The way you relate to one another is going to cause everything to be different. Uh, a good fa- paraphrase that I found of this is um, where it's talking about the koinonia, all right, is this. Philemon, I'm praying that the mutual participation that arises from your faith in Christ, the mutual participation, I like that, that arises from your faith in Christ might be effective in leading you to understand and put into practice all the good that God wills for us and that is found in our community. Because you declare Jesus is Lord, because you are in Christ, I'm longing that you recognize all of what comes with participating with him. It's found in him that your community gets to experience all the good of that with you. I like that. Can you say fellowship with me? Fellowship. I don't know what else was going through Paul's mind. I can't wait to ask him. I wonder if he thought of saying, because, you know, they didn't have most of the New Testament at this point in time. Hey, did you remember the story that Luke tells um, about Jesus sharing about the prodigal son? I-, I wonder if he thought about including that in this. Like, do you remember... Philemon, that story, like the the son's off and is squandered and done wrong and he comes running back and while he's still a long ways off, the father runs out to meet him. He's coming back out of self-preservation. Do you remember that, Philemon? Like he just says, if I could just go be a slave in my father's house and I'll eat stuff that's not pig scraps. Like that's why he's coming back. And while he's still a long ways off, hasn't even apologized, the father runs out after him 
unashamedly ugly run probably. Ugly run towards the sun, takes his robe off, puts sandals on, a ring on, and says, come sun. Do you remember that? Do you remember the older brother refusing to go in the party and see his brother in the same way? It's kind of like you, eh, Philemon? You know, when we are in Christ, we literally do get to put on what he would do in every situation. We get to embrace that into our own life because we say, that's the best way. He ran while his long way off out of self-preservation. We get to do that with one another. Radical fellowship that we have with one another. That's what it looks like to put this in Christ thing. Are you getting kind of, I love this. I wish he had more case studies, more personal letters. That's what I want in the New Testament. There's only like two, but it'd be nice, wouldn't it, if there's more of these that just kind of help us along? So I thought today we'd practice, and I asked a bunch of you to write some things you've seen about John that aren't very good, and we'll practice reading those in front of the community. No. (laughs) But we'll read those in front of the community today. (laughs) John's just like, what? No. But listen, hey, in Christ... We have a family that we belong to that we get to walk with in a way that allows us to sharpen one another and call one another up in what it looks like to be in maturity, to walk in maturity, to be found in him in every situation in our life. What would it take to be a community where we could read like those type of letters in our midst? I'm not talking about like, hey, we should just do that because that would be really good. I'm talking about like, I wonder what kind of fellowship we need to have with one another. That that just would naturally flow out because I know that when I'm with you and open myself up to you, God comes into the situation. I see and I'm challenged what it looks like to be found in Christ when I give myself to the community in that way. We walk in the fellowship that we're supposed to have. Can you say fellowship with me? Fellowship. Kind of a fun word, isn't it? Fellowship. All right. So let me just, let me just go two places all right, here, practically speaking. Um, it's 1130, right? Is it 1130 right now? Okay. All right. Okay. My watch is still on Eastern time for some reason. All right, I was getting nervous, so... <laughs> Did I really go a half hour over? I'm getting started. This is so good. Um, all right, so let me just talk practically about two things that I'd like us just to look at with Philemon and Colossians and let it kind of hit us a little bit as well, okay? So the first thing is this about elevating our Christology, elevating Christ, elevating how we view the work of Christ, what Christ means that he entered into our midst and to be found in him, okay? Um, what does it mean to really elevate our Christology, all right? Um, If you're back in Colossians, all right, I think the whole book is full of this, but I love Colossians, the hymn, one of maybe the earliest Christian hymns that we have recorded in Colossians 1.15 or poems. He is the image of the invisible God. Who's he? Who's he? Christ, Jesus, right? Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers, authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. We could keep going, but like, uh, who's supreme? Who's central? Jesus is Lord, hence Caesar is not, right? Jesus is Lord, hence my wallet is not. Jesus is Lord, hence whatever is not, right? He is before all things, and him all things hold together. Do we believe that? Very early on, God comes along and makes man and woman 
in his image, right? Now, sin's corrupted that. But he's given us the image of what he's like. And hence, we get to make the choice of walking back into our vocation, which he planned for Adam and Eve from the very beginning, to be image bearers of him. This isn't just about, I can't do this because of sin. Like, do I want to reflect him or not? This is what it means to be followers of Christ. This is what we are saying is worth living for. It's the best possible way to live. It's who we're meant to be. It's only in this that we find purpose and real being. Being the image bearers that reflect him. In order to do that, we have to put him before all things. Bring him up over and over and over again, right? He is the image of the invisible God. The exact representation of what he's like and who we are to be as well. The sun, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. And we could just add in, after he does basically in the entire book, and say, and who we're supposed to be as well. We're not God, but we're supposed to be image bearers of him. Hello. We get to be like him. No one has ever seen God, but he stepped down and made him known. And we get to continue to be like him. We elevate Christ over and over and over and over and over and over and over again in our life. It doesn't depend on human tradition. I care what Caesar says about death penalty and slavery. Paul says, who are you in Christ? I don't care how everybody else around us spends their money. Who are we in Christ? Hear how everybody else talks to their kids? Who are we in Christ? I don't care what everybody else says community looks like. What's that mean in Christ? Hello. You with me at all? I think this is exciting. In Christ. In Christ. In Christ. Elevating him. It should all be different because it's going to be kingdom. It's going to look different. We're going to find ourselves doing everything different, because in Christ it looks a lot different. Um, so we have uh, some neighbors that we've been ministering to uh, since we moved in. They moved in about the same time as us, and, and um, have been on a journey of sharing Christ with them, and, and um, it's had its ups and downs, and some moments of good and bad, and um, just before Christmas, I was bringing Cleveland home from practice one night, and we get home, and he's like, why is that person on our porch? Who is that? And it was dark, couldn't quite tell, and as we got closer, I realized it's my neighbor, and, um, and he wasn't, he was crying. And, uh, and so anyway, I was like, go inside the house. I don't know. And um, had a conversation where his marriage had blown up, um, he says, it's over, I think. Uh, my wife won't even talk to me. I don't even know where she is at the moment because this just happened. Can you try to help figure things out at least so I can make sure she's safe? And da 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 And uh, just a train wreck. Um, and um, the whole street kind of knows because it's didn't, some things happened and it didn't go well. And he moved out and... It's coming and going a little bit, trying to help with kids, and, and um, very broken, um, very visual and public in some ways. And um, outside um, a couple of days later, and, and uh, one of my neighbors comes up and says, so how are we going to do this? Like, I don't know all the details, but like, whose side are we on here? And we're not on any side. We want to see real reconciliation. We want to see real life break in. Life for them, life for the kids. I'm not saying that any of us, in any of us, it's possible for any of that, but do believe that actually a real way of walking forward would look like this. And so we're not on anybody's team. We're going to surround every single one of them best we can. Do you know that in Christ, it looks so much different? 
and we elevate him in his way. We don't take sides like the way the world does. Anybody notice that there's a mess right now? Division? What if the church would actually be who we're supposed to be? And Christ show the world the way forward that no political party understands, that no different ideology understands, and says, look, this is how it looks in Christ. Are you with me? I think the world's hungry. I think our country's hungry for it, for us to rise up and to be who we're meant to be, but it's in Christ. It's constantly elevating him over us over and over. So we need to elevate our Christology. The next thing is this. We need to elevate Our ecclesiology, that's our view of the church, the body of Christ. Uh, Can you say fellowship with me? Seriously, what kind of fellowship is needed to be able to read those type of letters in our midst so that we can encourage and cheer each other forward? I think Paul didn't think it was awkward at all. I don't know what everybody felt that day. Onesimus standing in the corner when there's a letter being read to Philemon right, in front of everybody. What kind of fellowship, what kind of family are we meant to be? It's amazing. I find it absolutely breathtaking how God actually plans through the church by his Holy Spirit to accomplish his work in the world. Unbelievable. Do you know that Jesus didn't write down one single word on earth by himself? Like the word of God is actually, how did he do it? How did he do this? Through the church, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He gave us, he didn't even like, don't mess this up. He trusted the body of Christ in that way. To actually say, hey, this is a faithful representation of who he is. Trusted us to work it out over hundreds of years and disagreements. He says, body of Christ, your, my plan is to do it through you. Would have been nice, just clear a few more things up. Write it down a little more clear. Slavery bad. Forgiveness, good. That would have been nice, right? Just come be a little bit more clear on that. His plan is that through us, the body of Christ, we would represent him. They're supposed to get a glimpse of the heavenlies and the heavenly way of doing it in us. Isn't that amazing? Didn't even have like the first church service, so we could all do it exactly like him and know exactly how it should be for the rest of, until he comes back, right? He actually trusts the body of Christ with him and his Holy Spirit present to do it in a way that's going to honor him and bring him glory and work through all the disagreements and problems and say, hey, come on. Can I encourage us, body of Christ? Church is not just a gathering on a Sunday. But that's part of, what are we doing? How, what is our fellowship like? How do we relate to one another during the week so that we have Paul's in our life encouraging us and challenging us in the way we handle our Onesimuses? Are you with me? What's that look like? This is who we get to be as a family. Maturity will not happen outside of those things. It won't happen outside of us being rooted in the body of Christ the way we should, and relating to one another the way we should, and it won't happen without us putting him front and center the way we should. I love on Tuesday mornings, I have, every Tuesday mornings, I have some of those meetings in my life. One Tuesday meeting, it's my buddies, Steve and Ralph, who we share life with, like see him most days and talk to him most days, and they know typically, even before I say a word, whether I'm doing well or not, and they can hear me talk about whatever and say, like, oh, a little bit of cynicism there today, huh, Shane? They know me in those type of ways. And then the other Tuesday mornings, it's us younger guys and, like, Jim and Laura May's grandsons and a few others, and, and we practice that way of life together as well. How are we doing? We pray together, talk about how our prayer life is, talk about how our relationships are with family and for us who are married with our wives and some of those type of things what we're really struggling with, the good, the bad, the ugly. It's a gift. That's one of the greatest gifts in my life. I get to walk with them in that way. Maturity is realizing that God's placed us in a family. 
we get to push and challenge one another, put Christ in front and center and everything as we walk together. Amen? Can you say fellowship with me? Did you know that there's a type of fellowship that causes things like slavery to not stand a chance in our world? You know there's a fellowship that puts Christ front and center? Happens in our midst, in the body of Christ. That's who we get to be. Let me just pray for us, and then Jay's going to come up and clean up the mess, all right? All right. Lord, we, uh, I do just want to thank you for this family. I want to thank you for uh, the body of Christ that is here and that is an example uh, to not, this, not just this community but surrounding communities of what it looks like to love you and honor you and to put you front and center in everything. And Lord, we recognize that actually we all have room to grow, but Lord, I just pray that as they continue to um, not just open up this series, uh, but continue to share life together, continue to love one another and meet together and open the word together, that you continue to work through them in powerful ways that helps to bring you front and center. That causes the issues in this community, the slaveries or whatever it is, to have no option but to wilt and die because there's a community that's living differently that says Jesus is Lord and everything else is not. And Lord, I just pray that there would be a great joy in meeting with one another, a great joy in being able to open themselves up to one another in a way that's just going to um, reflect you, that this community would look like the heavenly community, the heavenly family, the Trinity, where you prefer and put one another front and center. Lord, I pray that Cornerstone would be that type of family. Lord, I just pray that it would be a joy week in, week out to see what it looks like to be found in you more, to be in Christ, to put you front and center and supreme over everything. Lord, I just pray that you would bless this group and continue to work powerfully, bringing them together and work powerfully as they live out their vocation, their destiny in you. Amen. Can I, can I just look at two things real quick with you? Just, I'm sorry, Jay. I just got to do it real quick. But can I just say this? The book of Ephesians is this wonderful picture of this, that God had a plan and a purpose from the very beginning that all things, things in heaven and things on earth would be summed up in who? And found in who? In Christ. And the writer of Ephesians says, you are his handiwork. You, body of Christ, coming together are his great poem, his great work of art that declares to the heavenlies, the principalities and powers in heavenly places, that that is happening. That all things are being found in Christ, summed up in Christ, and brought together in Christ. We are God's great work of art, his great sunrise and sunset that shows the world that that's taking place. And it's as you speak the truth and love to one another, you're built up into that. And he says, so live that resurrection life, church at Ephesus. Live this new creation life, church at Ephesus. Because remember what you are to the world. And he closes by saying, spiritual warfare looks like engaging in that. And I encourage you, warfare with what God is wanting to engage and to bring himself into looks like us living into that. Being who we're destined to be, being found in Christ together. It is our great pleasure to be part of that. All right? Sorry, I had to say that.